Yes, so soon enough you will see a lot more faces on video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, we got a B. See, we're going A's and the B comes. But we got a long line from the starting point. Huh? A's and B's. And we still got only one Y and a V at the end. And Bivavsan, why are you looking so serious? Good evening, sir. Good evening. Where are you, Bivavsan? Bhubaneshwar, sir. Mm -hmm. But you are part of XLRI in Jamshedpur. Correct. Correct. Yes. Uh, uh, because of the COVID situation. Yeah, people are at home. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I know there's a very fine XM in uh, Bhuvaneshwar to which I've been and spoken with the students there some, I don't know, 30 years ago, I guess. No, no, not that far. <laughs> Maybe 15, 20 years ago. <laughs> Yeah, so we are hoping the next batch also gets to reach campus soon. Yes. Because camp I mean, there's no real substitute for campus life. Right. Mm. Are you sure in Gurgaon, aren't you? I'm in Delhi, sir. Oh, Delhi, right. Mm. Are you planning to go out a little bit now that the lockdown is less? No. Uh, last time I decided to do that, I got COVID. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Uh, I think we could take a check about who are the wounded soldiers in this war in the group already. How many of you have been found positive with COVID? There's Ayush and there's myself and who else? I, I just want to point out, sir, that I got COVID pneumonia. I had that entire one month, but technically I never had it because my RT-PCR never came out positive. Wow. Wow. So I was like the reverse, completely asymptomatic, but it said I've got a very heavy load actually. So I said, Pata nahi kya ho raha hai. I'm feeling fine. My oxygen levels are fine. No, no temperature. But then, you know, you're in quarantine and uh, no one can come and etc. So how did you, uh, you said that uh, your test was negative. But yes, you, decided you, were, you decided you were infected, right? I lost my sense of taste and smell and I had fever. Mm -hmm. so I figured it's probably COVID. I got a mm. CT done. The CT showed COVID pneumonia. Ah. So at that point, I decided that the RT-PCR might not be accurate. Yes, yes, yes. Very interesting. You got your taste back, sense of uh, smell yeah, back? Now, now it's back. Yes. Now, you like food? Yeah, now, now I was very scared when the sense of taste went. Yes. Because I was like, okay, one of the few joys in life. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but thankfully now, the sense of taste is back. The weakness is gone. So, uh -huh. right, the situation at some point was so bad that you couldn't complain. Like, if you if you got COVID and you didn't have to get to a hospital, you just express gratitude and move on. Right, right. So I hope all those who are on the screen right now that I can see and others that uh, you didn't have too many tragedies uh, in amongst friends and family. Sir, in our batch, quite a few people lost people in their families or people very close to them. Mm. 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 This was just that kind of year. Yeah. And tragic. Mm. Mm. So, on a brighter note, Hmm. Uh, good evening, all of you. Now, it doesn't very hop. Uh, it doesn't happen very often that I find myself overawed and at a loss of words. But today is such a day because, on behalf of the Cotilla Consult Club of XLRI XPGDM, we have the honor of welcoming Mr. Arun Myra. Now, Arun Myra, sir, brings with him an experience of fifty-six years in leadership positions such as Senior Vice President Arthur D. Little, Chairman India of the Boston Consulting Group, and a member of the prestigious Planning Commission from 2009 to 2014. At present, Mr. Myra is the Chairman of HelpAge International, an international NGO working to help older people claim their rights. Any introduction, sir, falls short when hosting you, but I've tried my best. So. <laughs> Welcome to XLRI, sir. Over to you. 
So thank you, Ayush. Uh, it's been such a pleasure uh, to uh, be even in this few minutes interacting with you and uh, uh, the friends that I can see your friends uh, uh, on the screen. And I believe there are you know hundred people uh, listening in uh, to me now. So I am uh, very privileged and thank you all for being here uh, with me today. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to begin just where we were in the conversation amongst the few of us, because what are we going to talk about? I mean, you are, all of you, um, uh, students of the XLRI's different programs, various programs. Some of you in the one-year program, your senior people having done some work already, some others who've also done some work, but uh, the, the regular programs. Uh, management uh, is what uh, interests you. It's at the backdrop of what you do. Uh, either or you do it explicitly, or if you're doing any uh, social work or policy work, the managing of it is uh, uh, necessary. So it's, a, it's an orientation that you learn um, in, a, in a school, which is a management school, and the programs associated with the management school. So my life has been about managing things. And we were talking just now about COVID. Uh, and it's very intriguing to me uh, that, uh, uh, you know, we know we've got a big large scale global problem and we need to find solutions on scale for this problem. Hmm? So here we have the situation that uh, we've got a, a big impact that's been created on the world on scale by a little virus, very tiny, and there must be billions of them uh, all over the place who are uh, um, affecting us, our conditions. And we are countering it with vaccines. And these vaccines are also have to be produced on scale because we need lots and lots of them. And uh, the problem in the world right now is how to get enough vaccines everywhere in the world to counter this virus that's appearing everywhere in the world. It does seem that so far the virus is winning. And even now recently, when we talk about uh, the new variants that are emerging from A to B to C to the Ds, now, the uh, uh, producers of the vaccines find that the first set of vaccines that they produce, you know, great concentration, a lot of good uh, investments um, and being produced on scale and the standard, the standard vaccines on scale, uh, they would have to reinvent uh, the vaccines or modify the vaccines to counter this enemy that is able to, so they're very, very small, keep changing themselves and what they do collectively so there's a fight between the big and the small, and the small at the moment is, is winning by a form of organization, which the big uh, does not know, and it organizes itself differently. And at the same time, one is watching the uh, uh, conflict between uh, people in uh, uh, Gaza and uh, Israel, and uh, you might be your people who are familiar with technology or watch technology. It's amazing to see how uh, in Israel, they've got these domes and things that fly and the, the poor guys in uh, Hamas, they are inventing rockets, but these big guys with the technology are able to destroy uh, their, their rockets. Hmm? So there are questions here about uh, um, the use of technology, the management of technology, the deployment of technology, and also the forms of organizations uh, that uh, um, are uh, possible. And then combining technologies and forms of organizations, how can we make the world better for everyone? Hmm? Now, I was told by Ayush that please don't give us a lecture on management. We are here to have a conversation with you <laughs> about your life and what you have learned. But this is the question I have now. So I can't help saying, I'm saying where I'm currently, but I'm going to go back uh, into my uh, own uh, history and say what was motivating me when I was much younger, when I was uh, perhaps your age or a little younger than you, when I finished college um, in 1960, when was it, four? Yeah, got it right, 1964. Um, and was wanting to you know, do something in the world, to have a career uh, in the world. At that time in 1964 in India, uh, we were a country just become independent 
uh, 15 years before that or 17 years before that, and still, you know, very poor, uh, not enough uh, business organizations, not enough uh, even industrial organizations in the country, not enough public services in the country. So uh, the um, aspirations of people in my class and everyone I seem to know in college was, could they somehow serve the country? And many of them gave up that aspiration because they felt they would not be good enough to pass the exams for the civil services as the IAS, IFS, which was supposed to be the, the only legitimate way in which one was uh, uh, going to serve the country. Because uh, in this way, by being in the IAS or the IFS, one was representing the country, serving the people of the country, not being given much money for oneself, but one got respect um, and one did work that one felt was uh, you know, for others. There were possibilities, of course, even then to join businesses, very few possibilities, and the businesses paid much more. And the life was easier. You lived in bigger cities, and if you were good companies and you were given a good flat to stay in and uh, maybe the service of a car with a driver and so on. So I finished college and I was uh, requested by the principal of my college, St. Stephen's, to, since I had a year more to sit for the exam, to in that year, uh, go meet with the Tata group because they asked the principal to send a couple of people over if they could consider them for leadership positions in the group. And I was a bit put off because the reputation of all businesses was that they are people who make money, they produce stuff. And we just, we call dabba walas like metal box. They produce, you know, the dabbas and the, the, the people from Hindustan River were also dalda tins and the dabba walas or soap walas. I mean, what's this here? You're producing soaps and dabbas. Yeah. Well, what's so great and intelligent uh, about doing that? Yes, of course, you make a lot of money and you live well. Like I said, and your salaries are twice that of what you would get if you were in the IAS, but make enough. So I was a bit shocked that he would suggest this to me, knowing that he knew me. So he said to me, he says, uh, I was president of the college union and did pretty well otherwise. So he said, no, they're looking for people who might be uh, leadership potential. So, you know, do you think your leadership potential is like a challenge? I'm going to go meet them and see what are they looking for? Why is it that uh, I'm not good enough for that? So when I went there to the Tata group and they had these interviews for the TS, you know, the directors and spent three days just asking all of us uh, what we liked, what we did, how we learned what we had done and interacting with each other in groups and they observed us. And so at the end of which uh, we asked them, um, you know, what is the job we are going to do? And they said, well, you're going to be learning to be an effective business manager. You know, none of you have done business before. Obviously you've done physics or history or whatever, but you're going to learn on the job and you're going to learn to create something with us, with the Tata people. And uh, hopefully that'll be a very satisfying career or life for you. And uh, to me, they said very specifically, we know that you want to serve the country. Let us tell you that uh, Mahatma Gandhi said about Jamshed Ji Tata, that uh, while Mahatma Gandhi was fighting for India's political freedom, Jamshed Ji Tata was older than him and before him, had been fighting for India's economic freedom. Jamshed Ji Tata was creating enterprises in India, which the British did not want India to have. And uh, therefore, without any support from government was creating these so that Indians could do things just as well as anybody else in the world and not have to depend on others and providing, well, work and employment to people. But more than that, the opportunity for Indians to create things in the country, which would be good for the country. So there you will also serve the country if you joined us in Tatas. So I said, this is rather good and attractive. And by the way, they'll pay me twice as much as the Ah, yes, and there's no harm in that, provided I'm doing a service to the country. So I did join the Tatas. They, I was praying then that they would offer me the job, and they did. So I was selected in the TS. And I spent 25 wonderful years just learning, working with others, creating things that Indians had never done before. None of us had done something like that before. Some of our people, senior people, had worked under. German people creating a factory in Jamshedpur and learned from them 
how to do that. And those people were the few people who were then the nucleus of the new factory in Pune, factories in Pune that I uh, was enrolled into helping shape and create. And for my job was to look after the human side of the enterprise. Where can we find young people in India who've got the same spirit, who are willing to do hard work, tough work, factory work on the shop floor, rub their noses on the shop floor, not go into the uh, offices of uh, uh, Citibank, which had opened its things here and offered you know, people air-conditioned places to work and, and travel abroad and even in the sun lever um, and similarly. Uh, so where would you find these Indians? And I found in going out to the institutes, uh, XLRI, and, but, but more than that, there was the IAMs, which were the premier places to which young people went, that, uh, and the IITs, of course, that, uh, my goodness, the best Indians were so keen to join this enterprise, even though they could have been easily hired and were selected by these other organizations that I mentioned, the sort of world brands, who gave much better salaries and more professional careers to do that. So there was in India that spirit. And I, with such people who joined us, built great things, great enterprises in the country. So those were my 25 years. And uh, I was doing well enough and so rose uh, uh, to be the youngest director of a Tata company. Um, uh, you know, I was in my uh, late 30s only when I got there. Uh, then seven, eight years later, um, so there was a first turning point, as I said, away from joining the civil service to joining uh, a business enterprise. A second turning point came in my life uh, when like I was 45. Um, and my daughter, who was around uh, uh, 17, 18 at the time and was in uh, uh, university in uh, college in the US on a full scholarship, uh, didn't keep too well. And my son, who was two years younger, wanted to get to college and would have gotten to some college in India, I guess. Uh, but um, we needed to go to the States to look after our daughter. And so we had to bring our son along. And then I had to own enough to put him into college because he didn't have a scholarship like my daughter had. Um, so I had to go off to support the family in the US. It's 1940, um, 1989. Uh, and that time, um, GRD Tata, the chairman of the group, uh, told me that uh, it's a very difficult decision that I was making and I was very conflicted. Shouldn't I just stay on in Tata's way? I was rising very fast and enjoying you know, the, the success that we were getting uh, together to you know, go off somewhere where, what would I do in the United States, as he said? I mean, no big company is going to go to hire an Indian manager in the 80s. And what have Indians done in management? This is, I'm talking 30 years before the IT and Indian people running large companies there. India didn't have a reputation at that time. So he said, well, you could join a consulting company uh, and uh, maybe learn um, how to you know, help others to, to produce results. You're pretty good at that, he said, you know, helping people, teams in India to learn what they can do if they work better together. So why don't you go try? Maybe someone will hire you as a consultant and so on. So I did go there and I had a wonderful uh, 11 years in the United States learning to, to consult. And consulting in my mind was entirely about helping others to produce results that they wanted to produce by learning to do things that they didn't at that moment do or didn't know how to do. Hmm? So how do you be a coach to others to help them realize their aspirations? Hmm? So there I got engaged with, you mentioned senior vice president of Arthur D. Little, and I was a CEO of Innovation Associates, which was a part of Arthur D. Little, about organizational learning and how organizations learn. Well, as I said, I was getting quite familiar with how individuals learn to uh, make something of themselves. How do organizations learn to have more impact uh, for the good of everybody around themselves? So I learned all that and I was doing pretty well. When uh, time came, uh, another crisis, if you will, turning point in my life. Now, the work I was doing about organizational learning, like I said, was helping organizations to learn to do uh, what they wanted to do uh, and uh, didn't know how to do. And one of my clients at the time, when I was in the US, was an Indian company called Bharat Petroleum. It's a public sector company. 
Oh, you know it, Bharat Petroleum. It's the best uh, Indian public sector oil company. That's why India government wants to make it the first one to be privatized because it's got market value more than the others have. So, but this was a company that was completely public sector like the others were, but its chief executive is chairman uh, and uh, you Sundarajan had this uh, belief that as the market was being opened up to foreign companies in India, and the intention was that we're going to let foreign companies come and uh, you know, establish here and provide services to Indians. And you guys in the public sector, you better do it as well as them. Otherwise, you know, we're not going to support you. We can't keep on supporting you. So Sundarajan said, we are going to learn to do things even better than any foreign oil company does, wherever they are, and provide that type of service to the people of, of India so that there is no need for us to be replaced by foreign management here. Now, so therefore, this Indian company had to learn to do, as I said, uh, uh, something that they weren't doing. And that's why people said public sector doesn't perform as well as firm. They weren't doing the sort of things that would provide even better service uh, to the, the customers and citizens of, of India. So he said, we want to learn very fast. So your skills in helping organizations how to be faster learning organization, can you please help us to learn how to be faster learners? And so that was my engagement. And in that um, while, they were learning how to scan their own environment more intelligently, to see opportunities in their environment, to see threats in their environment, to shape strategies which took advantage of the opportunities, to learn to build the capabilities to take advantage of the capabilities and the capabilities to fend off the threat. So there's an internal learning agenda and there's a learning agenda about the world around yourself too. So this method of systems thinking based organizational learning and strategy making was something that I was and my company becoming pretty good at. So I was, we were as a company, part of a group of companies, small companies uh, in America and around the world who were exploring with each other the art and skills of organizational learning. So we had a master class uh, in uh, 1998 or nine, just after India had uh, Run that bomb in Pokhran in the desert. Uh, before which, for the couple of years, as I said, I had been working already with Bharat Petroleum. At this master class, these five, four or five companies or persons from these small consulting companies who had done something which would be very interesting to share with others to learn how to improve our method of helping companies to be faster learning organizations. We said we'll compare notes. So we had this master class. So we had, I was the only non-white person um, asked to present uh, my story. The first four before me were three Americans and two Europeans, and they presented their cases of what they've done in terms of system thinking and organizational learning with their clients. And their clients were, well, American companies and European companies who pay well to consultants and they were there. And my client was, I uh, was the fifth person to speak was, the Indian company who hadn't paid us very much because they couldn't, but we were doing work. And since Sundarajan's whole thesis was, I don't want too many consultants here because then I have to pay them. Can't you teach us how to teach ourselves to be faster learning organizations? So that was a you know, second step. Be a coach to coaches, and they would be then the facilitators within their own organizations. So I was the last, and I told my story, and I think uh, the whole masterclass all the others also were very appreciative, except that there was one um, American person who had presented uh, his story. It was a very large transformation exercise. And, you know, there was a excitement about the scale of what um, um, he had done. Um, uh, so he, as he was hearing me, finally, this brown guy, brownish guy stands up and talks about a little Indian public sector organization. Kya hai yaar him? Um, so, and so when I finished, uh, it was clear that everyone appreciated my story most of all. So this guy gets up. And my story about Bharat Petroleum was how the leaders of that company scanned their own environment and found that there's poverty in the country. They can't be selling products and services at higher prices. They've got to innovate and change their service to make it affordable at very low price points because Indians can't afford to pay more. So there's great innovation uh, in, in, in what they were doing and how they were organizing themselves to do that. Hmm? 
Uh, so I was talking about India also. In my story, there was a description of the scenarios of India and then the journey of capability building of uh, uh, Bharat Petroleum. So he could see the sort of blows in people's eyes and the appreciation. So he stood up and said, you know, people in India, the government of India and the people of India have no business to be building economic device, sorry, atomic devices when there's so much poverty in the country. We can't trust, the world can't trust uh, people who haven't learned yet how to use technology responsibly with powerful technology like uh, the nuclear bomb. And I couldn't help saying the only country that has used a nuclear bomb against a civilian population is I couldn't complete my sentence because the red look on his face and then people said, you know, we better break this up. So the uh, facilitator of that uh, masterclass uh, woman, Jenny Kamini, said it's time for a coffee break, guys. We're going to assemble and then, you know, have a discussion afterwards. So she took me aside and said, look, um, just cool off. My heat was up. I mean, how dare this person think that Indians are less moral or less capable than Americans are? Hmm? So she said, look, uh, and she's a good friend and she was a colleague in Innovation Associates, said that, look, Arun, we know that you care so much for your country. Why are you using your skills to help rich American and European companies to make even more money for their investors? Why are you here? So I thought about it. I said, yes, we came here because uh, my daughter and my son were in college and uh, needed to be put on their feet. And they, they have passed through and they're married. And so, yes, why am I here? I need to be back in India. So I said, fine. I contacted folks in India. I said, I'm coming home. So that's how then I came back to India and BCG was setting up uh, uh, its operations in India, uh, very small at the time. And they asked me to to, uh, to nurture their operations as the chairman of their, their practice in India. So that was the turning point there. Now I had some very good years in, in BCG, in India where I wanted to be. And in India, it was not merely working with more Indian companies, um, but also getting to work with uh, social sector enterprises in India who were you know, finding new ways to produce benefits for the people without making much money or any money at all in some cases for themselves. So learning new forms of organizing, new ways of innovation alongside these uh, organizations in India, and also became in contact with the government. And occasionally it was the government asking for you know, more strategic um, uh, answers to strategic questions, but there's very little in those days and consultants weren't used by, by the government much. But, one got some of those opportunities. So we need to now be part of a more complex system, not just a business system. There was the people systems and, and government systems and all. And then, well, I turned uh, 65 uh, and my wife said, look, kafi ho gaya, career khatam ho gaya abhi. Abhi now you must retire and let's go travel and see the world. So I said, yes. And she said, you know, you have been traveling the world and by yourself for three, four days here, consulting here and that. And uh, you've not seen the world, you've just gone in went into offices and places and let's vote together and let's start with Eastern Europe. It's turning out to be a place where people say still not spoiled completely, very good cultures and cities like Prague and Budapest and so. So we took off. I retired officially told BCG, you look after yourselves. I'm here if you need me, but I'm off. The day we land in Prague, my wife and I, uh, I get this call from Monte Kaluvalia, who had been in college with me, um, saying, Arun, the Prime Minister would like to offer you a job as a member of the Planning Commission. So, Matho Hasgia, Malik, me, <laughs> he said, I know you and you would like to do serving for the country. Please, would please consider this. But you have to say yes before the Prime Minister speaks to you because, you know, it's not done. That when you made that offer, you say no. Hmm? So I won't waste his time also for that. You please say so. I said, look, but I'm here with my wife and I must consult her before I take this life decision. He said, absolutely, absolutely. But please do it soon in the next two hours because the prime minister wants to speak to you very soon. So we talked with my wife and she, of course, was very upset. She says, you know, then when are we going to be spending time together? You once again will say, oh, gosh, I'm busy with something. He'll carry on. 
And so, so while we hadn't even completely settled that, when this call comes from the prime minister and I had to take it, and uh, then of course he comes in and he said, uh, um, uh, Arun uh, is a very gentle person, Manmohan Singh. First he said, Mr. Myra. So I said, sir, please, I'm Arun, sir. He said, Arun ji, would you, I'm asking you to join me as a member of my planning commission and we want some changes to be made in our policies regarding industry. Uh, and you know a lot about it. Would you please serve the country? So he used the word, would you please serve the country? So I've been dying since college to serve the country. <laughs> so what do I say? I said, yes, sir. So that of course was the end of our holiday and uh, came back to India and spent uh, uh, those five glorious years uh, with uh, the planning commission. When I came back though, I did ask the prime minister immediately. I said, sir, um, are you sure I'm the person because I am not an economist and everybody in policy seems to be, it has to be economics. And the second is I have never worked with government. So I don't know. He says, that's exactly why we've got enough good economists and we've got not enough good government or people in government, but we're not producing the results for the people in the country. So um, I want you to be a full member and you'll have the usual responsibilities like other members, but you must be an inside consultant to us to think about and help us to think about what we must change about the uh, uh, ways in which we are planning in the country and uh, engaging the people of the country uh, to implement uh, the changes. So that was just beautiful, just beautiful. So then those years were over after five years. And then I said, now I must really not get tempted to do anything formal and official. And of course, there were lots of requests from large companies to join their boards. I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I just want to be uh, helping young people or people who are wishing to find new ways, better ways to help other people to form enterprises which will serve uh, the needs of the poorest people of the country. So that's what I am presently, uh, Ayushan friends, on a learning journey with young people on how to produce more results for other people in the country and not merely produce more profits for investors in enterprises. Okay, so I'm going to pause here. Those are decisions I have taken and what I have learned after having taken those decisions. Uh, the floor is open for questions. Good evening, sir. Yash here. Hi, Yash. Uh, it was really exciting, you know, going through the humble uh, journey that you have had in your career. And, uh, you know, I come from a life sciences uh, background. And, uh, you know, I share something that uh, is similar to your vision of helping uh, to serve the country. And I want to do it in the healthcare sector. Mm -hmm. which during the COVID times we have seen, you know, India does lack a lot of uh, infrastructure for healthcare. So uh, can you, you know, help me in uh, what kind of uh, planning or how does the Indian government actually, uh, you know, plan all these things and uh, you know, how we can, how I can help uh, enter into the government uh, planning commissions or, you know, even there are programs from United Nations that uh, work on the healthcare uh, sector for India. Thank you, Yasha. Clearly, the COVID has shown us that um, India has failed its people in many, many things. And yes, we can keep saying that, look, how much better we are than we were at independence and how much better we are than we were in 1991. So comparing ourselves against our own past and our own past performance, yes, we are doing better. The question is, the pace at which we are learning to do better is not good enough for improving our country and the conditions for the poorer people in the country. And the COVID has revealed this. We might have been very happy with the GDP growth rates that we had till about four or five years ago, you know, getting to nine, 10% the fastest growing um, democratic economy in the world. We were there, but during all that time, we were growing the top line, uh, the GDP line and companies were going up and their stock prices were going up and the stock market was going up. 
public health clearly wasn't being attended to. Yes, and that's been exposed as the probably the, at the moment the biggest weakness for the lives uh, of people in in our country. Now, I when I was as I said in the uh, BBCG and the government occasionally did consult us and ask us that what is the opportunities for ourselves. So I'm talking now about the years 2007-8 uh, at that time. Oh, no, no, it was actually when Atal Bihari Bajpai was still the prime minister, so 2003 and four. And we said, well, look, it's a globalization. There's money available in uh, the richer countries. People want to invest in their money. We are short of capital. Hmm? We have skills and people with skills. At the moment, we're sending the people with skills to go work uh, abroad in the IT firms abroad. It was you know, a labor triage, which made Infosys and TCS very valuable companies. So we have the talent here and they've got the capital. If we can draw their capital to with the talent here, we can create world-class enterprises in India, in India. And these world-class, if they're business enterprises must you know, have customers who pay them good money so that they can grow and pay off their investors. The healthcare sector, we say is a very interesting one because the Indian doctors are very good and they were serving in the US and hospitals as in the UK and so on. If they could be uh, you know, tempted to stay in India and capital could be drawn to build up Apollo, like became one chain and, and uh, uh, escorts and they're up to Medanta. So this idea of having world-class five-star hospitals and attracting medical tourists. So India gets put on the map as well as we get the money, which is available people out. So they're spending it. It's in a business end, in a business way. So this was one of the ideas. And we had four or five such strategic opportunities for India to build up world-class facilities in India, which richer people, uh, would willingly pay money for. So in the world-class hospitals, again, Indians who were traveling abroad to get their treatment said, I, like in Gurgaon, most people say, why would I go anywhere else? I've got the world-class as best doctors and hospitals. In fact, people are coming from outside, I'm gonna stay here. But it's the rich people who can afford this. And this is what has been showed up in COVID time. That we were busy building the top, the shiny parts of, of healthcare and not right. the unshiny parts the yeah. public health parts. And the public health parts has two aspects to it. One is that, you know, uh, less expensive and more distributed small, let me say hospital facilities or clinic facilities, which are accessible to people in the country. So that's one aspect of making healthcare accessible. The other in public health, people get ill because there's no sanitation. People get ill because they don't have enough food. That's all part of public health, yeah. Public health improves when the system is improved, not hospitals, world-class hospitals. So this change has to first come about that if you wish to really contribute towards um, improving public health, the okay. health of poor citizens, um, you could get a job in a hospital will pay you much more, a private hospital. Okay. Or with a consulting company, which says we are consulting to public health, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> So you think about it, what do you genuinely want to do? Yes, there are other organizations, uh, including some in the government who are doing support for public health in good ways. They won't pay you much, but they are really solving difficult systemic problems. Hmm? Right. Thank you so much, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. So first of all, um, it's a total, total delight having you with us this evening. Um, sir, my question is, uh, a little on the personal side. So you've been uh, heading and leading companies through the years, all through your tenure. And uh, my question would be, sir, how is it? How difficult was it to take on to such new challenges? Was it ever overwhelming for you? And if at all, what was that one thing that kept you going? You know, uh, I mentioned to you that we were creating this uh, terrific enterprise in Pune, the it was called Tata Engineering Locomotive Company at the time, but became Tata Motors uh, subsequently. And I was uh, in my late twenties only when uh, the Sumant Malgaon was the chairman of the company, who was the real architect and the builder of uh, not just these Tata Enterprise, the Telco Tata Enterprise, but many others uh, enterprises. Uh, um, so he had asked these uh, senior people who I mentioned, who had learned from the Germans how to, you know, run a factory. Uh, and that factory had been designed in Jamshedpur by the Germans. They had chosen the machines and the machines came from Germany. 
from people who knew how to build world-class machines in Germany or Japan. And those were put down. And the Germans were you know, the architects and the designers of the organization into which these Indians were plugged. And so they learned how to operate an existing world-class designed factory. Now in Pune, we had to create our own design and to implement that design. So these people also had to learn to do something they'd never done before. So they had to learn new things. And we needed now lots of young people because you need lots of people in a large factory. And these young people didn't even know industry that we were going to find from IITs. I mean, they're taught the theory of industry, but they've never been in a factory. And so, so everyone is going to have to learn to do something that they've never done before. So Mr. Sumut Mulgaonka would uh, uh, you know, uh, ask these top planners to come and show him. So what is the plan now? And then how much money is required? What's the timetable of getting the things? Where will they come from? By when will this factory be up? So they would develop uh, the thing and come and present to him. And I was his executive assistant. So I was sitting in all the meetings. And then he would you know, keep enjoying, very good. My goodness, this is a good layout here and very smart. Where did you get the idea of a this sort of grinding machine. And he was a fine engineer from uh, uh, the Imperial College himself. So, you know, he could challenge anyone in engineering and said, fine, fine. So they were, you know, feeling challenged and, you know, growing, and understanding the engineering of this factory. And then um, at the end of the second time they came, he said, you know, you're all missing something. So they said, I wonder what. So they went back and tried to improve their designs of the factory and the choice of machines. So he said, oh, gosh. That's even better than before, but you're still missing something. So the third or fourth time when he said this, they said to him, sir, please, we don't know what it is we are missing. So he said, gentlemen, and they were all men, you know, you got the machines and you got the buildings, but where are the people? I mean, do you think these things are going to run by themselves? Where are the people? Have you thought about where those people are going to come from and how they're going to acquire the capabilities? And we need to do some very good human resource planning. Hmm. It is called manpower planning by him. We need to do that. The sources of people who could learn, setting in place processes in our organization for them to learn side by side. While they're building and doing, they're improving their own abilities. So how do organizations learn? Now he was using these terms in the 1970s. And I said, this became an official discipline of organization learning only in the 1980s and 90s in the US. But you know, this is the real life. This is how you grow things. So they all, he said to them all that since you couldn't even think about it, we are going to have to find someone to do it. And I'm asking this guy here, Arun Myra, who was busy taking some notes, saying, Myra is going to do it. So Myra said, Me? <laughs> I know nothing about it. <laughs> so they said, Yes. He said, That's why your innocence is going to compel you to accept ideas about this. You're not going to overpower people to say, but I know how to do it and so on. So go out, my friend. He said, and you know what he said? That's his humility. Even I don't know how to do it. We learn together. Fine. So I started, you know, uh, asking, inquiring uh, and so on. And then came the time when he said to me, it's a thing happened that the person in charge of the factory, much older than me, almost my father's age, he had a serious heart attack and this person therefore had to be out of commission. He said, now I was in my, again, I said my late twenties, early thirties. He said, you are going to be the chief of this operation. I said, me, you know, it's okay being your assistant and, you know, helping plan and think about all this, You're actually going and being the boss of all these senior people. They are also, you know, in their late fifties and I'm in my early thirties. I mean, what sir, uh, can I teach them? He said, no, Myra you're not going there to teach them. You're going there to learn from them. And it's so brilliant. So I've learned this in any situation that you go to, if you want to get that situation, the people in the situation to be inspired to do something. One is an aspiration to do something which is, seems impossible to them. The second is to understand that we all are limited, each of us, the boss and everybody. We are all going to be with this humility, learning to do each of our jobs better. I to be a better leader, you to be a better worker and so. And we are going to learn to support each other in our learning journeys. And so this way of thinking has helped me. So when I went, for example, to 
work in a consulting organization in America. By that time, of course, I'd been fairly successful in, uh, in India. Now, a company, Telco, of which uh, I was on the board now, we were setting up factories in other countries and uh, beating even Daimler-Benz in those countries with our own products designed by us, produced and sold by Indians, competing against the Germans and the Japanese and doing pretty all right. But then when you are asked to be a consultant to an American company like General Motors and Ford, who are you know, the biggest companies in the world and they have all the best scientists and best research establishments, what the heck would they expect to learn from an Indian manager? So I realized at the time that what they weren't doing well was respecting the workers in their own organizations. And the Japanese who were taking off the pants of the Americans, this is what the Japanese did very well. And we in India, A, by instinct, and B, because we were partners with the Japanese in introducing total quality management in India before it was introduced into the United States. This is something I knew. How do you get people to work together to solve their own problems as a team? Small groups on factory floors, teams of functional managers together uh, for the sake of you know, a better enterprise and better results. How do you do this? So I just said, well, I'm going to be listening to the people in your companies. If you give me that facility for just two weeks to go and just meet workers and meet so and so, then we'll collectively come back with you to you with an idea of how to, without more finance, just by using what's already with you, the energy within your company, you can start competing with the Japanese. They said, hi, this can't happen. Well, let's do it. So the plan comes and there's notice the workers telling them how to do it and said, okay, some of the bolder ones said, okay, let's take a risk. We'll give you six months or one year and see what comes out of this. Hmm? If we are finding the results faster, then you continue to be our consultant and we'll give you, you know, your company uh, more money to do this. And, you know, because they're succeeding with less capital and competing. And so this came and I learned then when I was then invited to uh, help a Mexican company, Semex. Uh, who were well, Mexicans from the south of the US border where the US of course are the gringos with all the might and stuff and Mexico joins the NAFTA. And so then US companies will have freedom to, uh, to go into Mexico. The Cemex felt, you know, we are dead now in the water. We are an old Mexican company and the Americans are going to come and destroy our business. But the Zombrano, the chief executive said, I want my company's people to shape this company to make it so world-class that they'll be proud of themselves and I'll have my picture on Business Week magazine and Time magazine. That's proof that the Mexican companies that all of us are fulfilling an aspiration. He wanted personal recognition as the chief executive of a Mexican company. They wanted in their lives something better for that. So let's listen to our aspirations together and shape it. And they did it, you see. And this was a consulting assignment that uh, I led for my company uh, uh, in Mexico. So such engagements taught me, as I said, that the heart of uh, uh, an organization is the hearts of people in the organization connecting and saying, we have a collective aspiration to become such an enterprise and to achieve that each of us must achieve what we want in our lives. Like for example, in Mexico, this, there were many people as I said, who were consulted, who spoke and spoke to each other. There was this worker, um, in a factory, in a cement plant in, in the remote part of Mexico. And of course, spoke no English, wasn't educated. So everyone was consulted to say, what matters to you most in life? And what do you think needs to be changed to make our company, from your perspective, world-class? And he said, you know, there's so much dust around here in the cement, uh, in, in the factory, that my uniform gets all dirty every day, my, my eyes and things and so on. And every night, my poor wife, Apart from you know cooking for the six, seven children or four, five children, she also has to wash my clothes so that I have some clean clothes to wear. She's working so hard. I wish this place here in the factory was cleaner. There was no you know dust spewing out of these machines. It'll make my life better. Now, if the factory's processes were tight, there would be less wastage of material, which is good for the company, improves efficiency. It's good for him also. So thus came out. What are the uh, the, the, the ideas in which the management should invest, which would be good for the people in the factory. And thereby, they're also helping the company overall to become the world-class and helping, as it so happened, the, the chief executive Zambrano to get his picture, not just once, but twice in a year in uh, the leading American journals. So this is the essence of leadership, I say. Yeah. Don't think of yourself. 
as the person who is teaching others. Don't think of yourself as the person on whom others must depend for instruction. Be informed and guided by all around yourself. And then they will naturally perhaps coalesce around you as a leader, as a catalyst perhaps, but not as their commander, as their coach and not as their commander. And leaders can be in different shapes, right? A leader can be a commander in chief. A coach also leaders, leads sports teams and helps them to produce remarkable results. The coach is never on the playing field scoring the goals and like Ronaldo being counted as the world's largest scorer. But Ronaldo couldn't score those goals unless the teams around him performed and to enable the teams to perform. So the whole team won and also Ronaldo. Who's the guy at the back, the coach? How does that person perform? What are the skills you need for that? I paused nine hands, it seems. So are you sure going to be? Um, hi, sir. Very good evening. Niharika here, sir. Hi, Niharika. Sir, uh, your journey throughout these 70 years, I mean, has been amazing. And we are, all of us, I mean, are in awe of your journey, your experience. I mean, you have seen the, you know, journeys, uh, the generations changing and guiding all of them throughout the Gen Z, the millennials, even, you know, the people before that. And sir, uh, I'm sorry uh, to the audience and to you that my curiosity is getting better of me here. I have two questions from you. Yes. Sir, one would be, uh, I was reading about you a while ago. I mean, a uh, couple of days back and there was a moment in your life for three years that you were uh, consulting and you were the director of you know five to six firms in those three years Con I mean at one go you were managing so many organizations and so what I, uh, I understand from your uh, perspective is that you don't even want to touch people who are on the higher level, but you want to go to the very grassroots level. You want to affect everyone in the organization. So these organizations were huge. How did you manage to, you know, consult them, make a change in their lives? And so what was your, I mean, inspiration, your perspective? How did you do that, sir? Good, uh, so I'm getting an entry to that question. See, one is you're talking about uh, the time perhaps when I was a director on the boards of six or seven companies, the Tatas and Mahindras and Godridges and, and uh, a few others. As a board member, you don't have to give much time yourself. Yeah, it's, it's sort of board meetings. But yes, before that, I was a consultant to many organizations where you have to give more time. So let's talking about the period, yes, there were many clients that we had, let's say BCG, uh, in India. And um, so how would I be doing justice to so many clients to help them to produce the results that they want? And this is now a true story. Uh, and my friend and colleague, Janmay Sinha, who became, uh, who's presently chairman of BCG, and who became the managing partner, um, uh, you know, at the time when I was still chairman. Uh, so, and when I came back to India in 2000, Janmay had come back and uh, he was, um, um, trying to build a practice of consulting to the public sector because the public sector in India were large organizations and they could benefit greatly by improving their effectiveness. However, the public sector wouldn't pay as much as the private sector would pay to consultants. So McKinsey had very large private sector clients and BCG was trying to get those. But for Janma, it was, he had the same spirit, I want to serve the country and therefore the public sector, I want to serve public sector banks and Punjab National Bank is a big bank and not yet a McKinsey client. So I want to serve that. And so sitting down with Punjab National Bank and they have to improve their performance to catch up with the new banks like HDFC and ICICI. And there was already at that time, standard chartered and you know the international standards of you know, service and so on. So what Janma said, you know, it's a large bank with 90,000 people. And unless every frontline employee changes their culture and their orientation. This bank can't produce its results. So after having developed the strategy, these things need to be done. All of those things required some change in people down the line and doing things differently. He says, now we've been asked to implement this strategy. Hmm? So I'm turning to you, he said. You know, I've heard your story of Bharat Petroleum, which was a smaller organization, but it, as I said to you, 
I mean, I didn't have much of a team with the chief executive or chairman said, I don't want the team because then we'll depend on you to do it. I want to learn how to do it myself. So he said, can you please give me a coaching about what I'm, how I must change my thinking as a consultant hmm? uh, to enable my job to be done. So I said to him, I said, Janme, you are saying to me that you need a large consulting team to go and switch on the lights in the hearts and minds of 90,000 people. I'm afraid, my friend, unless they want to switch on their own lights, the lights are not going to come on. Hmm? So give up this idea that you have to go and change them. You have to create conditions in which they will light up. They will light up. Hmm? So what is a collective aspiration that you can spark them with or help them to find? And your management job has to be to create the conditions for them to recognize what they want to do in their lives, and like the Simex story I told you, and then support those initiatives to do that. So this is uh, how then, as I said, I could be spending just a few minutes with Janmay. Of course, then he said, please talk to the board because they'll think it's a strange thing. Uh, that, uh, that's, but of course, their thing is we are bosses and we must tell the people down there and they must wait to see us and rather than going out and reaching to them, and so there's going to change of culture at the top to say, yes, I had to spend some time with the boards of the clients of my colleagues hmm, to try and get the boards on the top to change their approach towards their own people hmm, uh, do this. So yes, it was enjoyable practices that I did. But when I was on the boards of companies, it was, I would say, uh, disappointing because the boards again operate like I'm saying. They feel that they are the big guys up there they will decide on behalf of everything down there. And you really are not even in touch with your own organizations and hardly in touch with the realities of the world around because you've got domain expertise and that's where you're invited. Domain expertise is by definition, you define the domain. It becomes narrower and narrower expertise. Uh, you know, you're a specialist in a particular domain where the world composes of so many things working together. So the board is not open to exploring the world around itself. It doesn't have the processes for doing it. Hmm? And so I felt that you know, serving on boards, they pay you well, you get the glamorous idea that like you say, the boards are the largest, uh, best business groups in India. But was I really making a contribution in a board position? Or wasn't I making a better contribution by helping young consultants to help large organizations to transform themselves? And therefore, we're coming to the planning commission. This was the big change. We don't should not be behaving like giving people the state's budgets and telling the states what schemes to use. Just turn it around. Listen to the people. The states must listen to the people. The companies, of course, must listen much more to their people. From the ground up, understand the reality and how people will be making the changes in their lives, which will then be the benefit to you in the work that you do. Be partners of people in change. Um, sir, really sorry. I have a second question as well uh, today. Don't be sorry to me. You already taken permission of your group, and they're allowing you. Okay. So, by the permission of my batchmates and my friends, sir, uh, the second question would be: I was also reading about the Vision India uh, Foundation and the Rastram, uh, you know, uh, leadership program that we have, and uh, it's one of its kind of program that I have come across. Um, I would say that I didn't have a lot of interest in public policy making uh, before I joined, um, you know, MBA, but my MBA batchmates are so talented, they are so into all of this, that it has also ignited my interest into public uh, policy making. Uh, sir, uh, would you please tell us more about uh, this Vision India Foundation and how, um, you know, young individuals are, I mean, benefiting from that and how has uh, how this idea sprouted in your mind of vision india foundation it's not my idea vision india foundation was created by young people in iit delhi many years ago and their professors in delhi many years ago who had the feeling that uh, they should be uh, you know helping serve uh, the real poor people of the country so it's their idea and then they created these learning journeys of taking young people out to actually see india hmm? So they had uh, these yatras 
they would take people out on. And again, people like yourself who said, you know, I am interested to learn how to be more effective. Uh, you can call it public policy or you can call it social enterprise uh, in uh, helping uh, uh, improve conditions in, in India. So they take these people out and in those journeys, they would also go and sit with the the district collectors and to listen to what the district collectors do and of course talking to local NGOs and stuff. So just listening and learning from uh, various people doing things uh, in different districts and they come back and then compare notes with each other about what they had learned. And I got introduced when they invited me for at the end of their first learning journey um, to um, sort of listen to these young people but actually they invited me to speak to them. But I said I'm so curious about what they have learned so it, I first want to listen to them. And then, yes, I will ask them questions. Uh, they say, no, 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 but that's not fair then. You know, this is becoming like a test. You first have to speak and say something. Then, yes, we share the learning. And then you can ask us questions. So it was a nice format. Um, I, I did that. So what I liked about this group was that they were encouraging young people to learn, look at reality and to learn. Now, they've grown as a very large foundation been doing it. And as they grow and scaling comes, I find that more young people are joining and asking, I want to join public policy. So they're defining what are careers in public policy. You can be working in the uh, public affairs uh, group of Vedanta, uh, you can work public affairs group of Tata's or Birla, that's also public policy, right? You could be working in the government and that's also public policy. Maybe you could be working with an NGO or think tank which is doing work on the ground and influencing public policy working with uh, Aruna Roy, why not? That's public policy too. So what are careers in public policy? And so therefore you have to make choices. You say, well, if I worked with, with Medanta, Vedanta sorry, and uh, Tatas, I'll be paid well. And it's more glamorous, you know, I'll be going to suits in my business suits and women also will wear more formal suits <laughs> and go and sit with uh, people in government offices. It's a nice job of doing public policy. If I join Aruna Roy, like Nikhil Day, I'll have to go live in villages and be with the people. And of course, sometimes occasionally get placards and, and make demands. And yes, we will change the right to information as she has done. Isn't that public policy? Okay. Or uh, I would say that I want to maybe work in a CSR part of some company, which is not really public policy, but it is uh, helping to do things on the ground. And because my company would have some say in public policy, and maybe I'm connected with public policy. So please decompose, don't use the word public policy. Like, what do you care about? Whose lives do you want to have the impact on? And how soon do you want to do it? And therefore, from that will come your choice about what you want to do first. And whatever you start, will lead you to think about that subject more, understand it better. And yeah, there'll be turning points as you go forward. So I'm so happy Niharika that your colleagues have intrigued you in the subject of public policy, but I think and I believe there's in you the desire to do good for others. Or is there not? I'm asking you a question now. Um, sir, if you have noticed something in me, then it must be there. So thank you so and much. You have to answer the question yourself. And this is something every young person must ask themselves uh, frequently. Uh, and uh, when you are leaving college and choosing a career or coming back to college or you know, taking another step, what is it you most deeply care about? And on whose lives do you want to have an impact by being alive yourself? From that will come the choice of the path that you must take. Hmm? Right, sir. Very hmm. true, sir. Hmm. It, could ha it couldn't have been more crispier than hmm. this. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Ashika this side. Hmm. Sir, uh, uh, this was an amazing conversation uh, with you. There's just one thing that uh, I'm curious about. So hmm. when you mentioned that uh, you got a call uh, from your friend about the planning commission, so what, uh, what was that one thought that made you delay your retirement plan? Because I'm sure you and uh, your wife, both of you would have planned a good, uh, uh, let's say, journey yeah. after your retirement. So what was that one thought that you had that, okay, let's keep the retirement plan on hold and let's uh, get back to work? No, it was serving the country, Ashika, as I said, from 
uh, the time I was in college, because it was the Mahal uh, in India at that time, that, you know, use your life, especially if you had the privilege of a great education, uh, use your life uh, to help others. So that was like the Mahal, it's like in you. And then when Tatas, their whole values were that also. It was not about being the, the, the richest companies. It was about companies that uh, created, uh, you know, wealth for the community, for the country. So you, you know, grow up with those values. And then, as I said, it so happened that I went into the other world of uh, American companies and business where um, I could see that uh, there were different values and they were not my values. And that's why when Jenny Kemeny said to me, you know, why are you doing this here? Why don't you go back? So it was reinforcing my values. And when I came back to BCG, it was very clear to BCG. I said to them, I'm not, I'm going to be helping you to get big clients because you need to build your business. So they be business clients and they respect me in India. I mean, the people who were the chiefs of the business companies at that time, I, I'd known them before and, and as friends. So uh, yes, I can introduce you and I can, they will respect us and uh, you, but then you have to perform and I do that. But meanwhile, I'm back here to serve my country. That's why they said, okay, you have a different role. Otherwise, you know, we'd ask you how many clients you've got and what is your contribution. Yeah, please help us with that. But you must enjoy what you're doing, right? So I got that. And that is why I said during that time, so it's just evolving like that. And then my wife and I said, maybe I've done enough of that too. But then when you get the opportunity which you thought after college you would get, that you get it only so many years later, how can you say no? Absolutely, sir. Good evening, sir. Tanya, this side. Mm -hmm. Sir, you mentioned that you were with the Tata Group and it uh, for long years, like for 25 years, and you had the opportunity to work with JRD Tata. So what are some of the uh, most memorable moments uh, you had when you were in Tata Group? Well, actually, um, I was asked to write a book with my most memorable moments in Tata's, which Penguin published a year ago called the Learning Factory, how the leaders of Tata became nation builders. And there are, I forget, I think 15 or 20 stories in that. And many of them are about GRD Tata and some about, many about Sumit Bogalkar and, and a few other leaders, and Nani Palkiwala. Uh, so what I learned from these people, so I would say, yes, I'll share just one story or two stories with you at the most now, if you give us a chance. But if you could just, if you care to, uh, read that uh, book. And that is also reminding me, which I've shared with you, Ayush, earlier, that uh, next month or in early August, Penguin is producing my next book, which they'd asked me to write almost simultaneously, but they said, just give a gap. It's called The Solutions Factory. Hmm? It's a consultant's problem solving handbook where you'll find some of the stories I've already started sharing with you already. You'll find them there. So they're told uh, in a way which is easy to read. They're stories about choices that one makes uh, uh, when one is doing things. And so, but let's come back to the Tata, the two things from GRD Tata. Three things, and <laughs> I hope that I have the permission to share three. The one was the big one, which I've repeated quite often, and everyone knows it. GRD Tata had said, and this was in my presence, that I have to, as the head of the largest conglomerate in India and the most complex business conglomerate in the world, to take many complex, difficult decisions, and there are many dilemmas. So when he was asked, you know, how do you take these decisions? He said, I think first of what would be good for India and for the poor people of India. Keep that in mind. And then I ask myself, so what will be good for Tatas? Then I get that too. And if there's a dilemma between the two, I do what is good for India. And he said, you know, the beautiful part is, Somehow, sometime later, it turns out to be very good for Tata's also. But at the time of making the decision, I'm not making the calculation, how will this be good for Tata's? I'm trusting that if you do good things, the system will enable you to be healthy. Hmm? To be healthy. So that is really good. And that stayed with me. The second was uh, about him as a learner, as I say. I mean, he would go down and do things with his hands, even though he was in his uh, uh, 70s. And uh, as I said, he had been chairman for 50 years of the group and uh, so respected around the world. But if he saw a worker on the floor doing something with his own hands, which struck him as, my goodness, this is very complex. I want to learn to do it. 
G.R.D. Tata, till he died, had a workshop in his house in Altamont Road in the basement with a lathe and a couple of machines. And so going to the training school in Pune, the one that I said we were, the factory we were building, he saw a young person who had built something here, to see. it's called a spinner. It's a piece of single block of stainless steel from which you carve this very intricate little thing. Then you suspend it on gimbals in a circle also made out of stainless steel, single thing carved out and a base. And this thing can spin round and round and round. It's like a tranquilizer if you're a busy executive, it sort of calms you down. So they produced one of these and gave them to J.R.D. Tata. He was very impressed and he asked the young chaps, he says, well, what do you do? What machines do you use? And so on and so forth. A few months later, he arrives in Sumant Mulgaonkar's room in Bombay House with two brown bags. He opens them and there are two of these things side by side. And he said, Sumant, one of these was made by your boys the others made by me. Tell me which is which. <laughs> Very interesting. I think two stories is enough, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. I will definitely read that book. Good evening, sir. Nipul here. Hi, Nipul. Uh, yes, sir. Oh. sir, you have consulted many business leaders and IT uh, planning commission. So what was your key takeaway uh, while uh, consulting these leaders? Um, I felt there's a distinction I could see that there are leaders who are like J.R.D. Tata or Sumant Murgankar. Let me call them real leaders. They've not just got a title of CEO. And then there are people who got titles and we call them leaders. So we must in our mind distinguish between positions and titles and leadership. Hmm. And there are people who may not have a position, but they are great leaders. Hmm. They're able to lead uh, people around them to do things together, which they all want to get done and can't do unless they do it collectively. So that's leadership, isn't it? That's leadership. So I do say that what I have learned is what is real leadership and what are the uh, uh, orientations required and the skills required to be a leader and not just to be a CEO. Thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. Anam here. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, firstly, I'm a big fan of HelpAge Foundation and the great work they've been doing for the senior care ecosystem. And my mm -hmm. question is going to revolve around that, sir. Uh, I wanted to know from you, what are the major pitfalls do you think of the senior care ecosystem in India and what can be done to make it better? Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. I'm so happy that a young person like you <laughs> cares for older people. Yeah, I hope all of you do. Yeah. So let me say it's like this. I've got invited to, uh, uh, I told you that after the planning commission, I said that I'm not going to do anything formal. I'm not going to sit on any boards or something. And uh, some people came and asked me from England that uh, this organization called HelpAge International is looking for a new chair of their board. And would I please consider this? And the person who came to ask me was in Save the Children, a, a, a Britisher in India when I was chair of Save the Children in India many years ago. And he said, you know, Arun, sir, if, uh, Mr. if you would please consider this, we are, uh, we are doing a very difficult job because no one cares for older people. If you want to go ask for money for a cause, if you're looking after children like we were doing, you know, people care for children because your heart melts and they're the future and you must... Uh, provide for their education. It's, it's easier to run an organization that cares for children. And he says the cause is coming if you run an organization that cares for women. Thank goodness people are finding that's also a worthy cause because women will make a difference to the families and, and the economy and so on. But older people, no one cares. Yeah. So we are competing as an NGO for funds and attention for policies and then funds from the private sector and from governments against organizations whose cause is more emotional and economically more justifiable. So I said, this is an interesting question. Yeah. Why should it be that we dismiss human beings after they have contributed to uh, a bringing of myself as a children and, and, uh, you know, and led, led in communities and we dispose of them, okay, the time ho gaya, inko discard kar do. They're a burden now, you know, 
economic burden how are we going to provide for these older people their care homes and their pensions and so we can't solve the problem in this way to get people to uh, tug at their emotional strings because the competition of emotional strings for children and women uh, is going to be the much much stronger so it's going to have to be on a different thesis that older people are really very valuable and you are discarding a very valuable resource when you are short of resources and what is the resource that you short of you are short of wisdom from experience yeah so people they may have made their mistakes these older people and they may not have been to your mind very successful but they maybe did some things which weren't done adequately but they have time now and they've reflected on that there's a wisdom here and if you discard wisdom from any system so the system can become very efficient but can do very unwise things very unwise things so the whole world needs to consider older people as the least used and the fastest growing necessary resource for the world so you reorient this and then say but i want proof of concept of this so learning then uh from different countries which help age international allowed me to do i mean i was required to do i found i'm just going to use one country's example to illustrate it was in vietnam in vietnam the government had for some years by law it's in the constitution requiring that there be government funded women's organizations hmm? because they did believe that women leading in communities can make a big difference so you don't have to go asking for funds from charities and the government itself would provide women's organizations uh, the funds to to run themselves and also they had uh, created by law a requirement that older people associations if they met certain criteria would also be supported now to meet those criteria was becoming difficult for older people because you know they don't have the energy to perform like the uh, younger women's organizations were so there were people from the charity sector who said let's help these older people to uh, do things that matter to them and by that show that they can do things they start with things that matter to them and they can do things so there were then these older people's associations meeting every week to firstly get advice on how to keep their own health up which helped the government because the government did want to reach out to older people to help them to do things so that uh, public health you were talking about earlier so that they weren't a burden then on the hospitals and so on so you know look after your by exercising eating well consulting the local clinic when necessary etc so this the government was finding the older people's association was helping the government do its job and the older people by getting together together were finding that they could collectively look after an old widow in the community who had no one to care for her so they would all contribute a little bit not money but time you know i'll go and get the food for her or i'll go and sweep her house and you know help her and so helping each other so this way um uh, other younger people in the community said you know this is the spirit of this is amazing so they started to convert these older people's associations in the last four or five years into intergenerational groups of the community using the energies they had the younger people have different sorts of energies the older have different wisdom in helping improve the complete village communities and the services in the village communities so this uh, the this is the idea uh, by which we can be um, helping india improve because we got older people and i found the same in africa interestingly that uh, again it some of turns out to be only communist countries think of this that uh, zanzibar which was a communist uh, part of uh, it became tanzania they in the constitution require that older people shall be provided for and there in their case it was both the associations for which space will be provided in the government ministry and also older people's homes which the government builds in a very high class and i went in there and the president said to me he says please help us no one wants to use those older people's homes there is something wrong with the quality i mean there were beautiful places but the older people said we don't want to live in the homes our families say we need you in the house because you can look after the grandchildren while we go out and earn so please help us to tell the economists of the world that the older people are not a problem for which you got to allocate resources to build homes we need a different 
set of policies to enable uh, our communities to improve by the older people being the key resource within the community. Okay. Good evening, sir. Ankita here. Hmm. I have two questions for you. Hmm. First, uh, you have had a huge career and you would have had to make a lot of tough decisions. What would be the toughest decision you have made so far in your career or in your personal? Well, that comes back to my third story of GRD, which I didn't say. So I said, here's uh, myself doing uh, at a young age uh, very well, um, and valued by uh, the seniors in our group, GRD Tata and Mugankar. And so, and then comes this uh, sort of personal crisis where I said my uh, daughter wasn't uh, well, but uh, wasn't in that sort of unwell that uh, she couldn't stay on in uh, uh, her college in, uh, in the US. And the doctors in India who consulted uh, to, and we checked said, there's nothing that can be done medically really. She just needs uh, to be nurtured a better with some sort of medical assistance. So to bring her back to India, to put her into a college in India, which you know, she had got herself a, a full scholarship, including travel paid for and everything. I mean, was, she did extremely well. Um, and she would just feel as a come down and what sort of education is she going to get compared to what she was experiencing? So for her flowering, um, my wife and I, or at least my wife should be in America. Meanwhile, I said, my son needed to be in college. Now we can't leave him behind. And the, the three of us are disappearing there. So we said, we bring him over to do that. And I thought, if he's taken over too, then of course uh, I have to earn some more money to have a home and then pay for his education and so on. So um, a tough decision. I mean, um, I can stay back here with Tata's and yeah, my daughter's there. My wife said she will go and spend some time, uh, you know, to be near her and stay with my brother who was there. And, but the family would be sort of broken apart. It'd be my son staying back and I'd be with him and uh, my daughter who I care for and my wife there. And so, so the dilemma was then I asked Suman Bulgaukar because he was my boss and a such a lovely, lovely person uh, to say, what do I do? He said, you know, I can't help you. This is a very personal decision. I, I'd be shattered, you know, we are developing you to take over here, hmm? but I can see you got a dilemma. And so why don't you go talk to Jay? He's a very wise guy, Jay being Jayadi Tata. So Jayadi Tata said, yes, uh, Suman said, you're going to come and see me, Myra. And uh, he talked me through my dilemma about, uh, you know, the challenge of going to another place, learning to earn in new ways and the difficulty at the same time, uh, you know, giving up uh, a path on a career here, which I was uh, on the top of. And so he said, Myra, I'm going to say something to you, which will hurt you, but I think it might help you in your decision. Myra, you know, your daughter has only one father. And at this time in her life, she needs a father. I'm going, I'm going to hurt you, Myra, but we need you too. But we can find another Myra. <laughs> so what would you do? You know, where is your responsibility? Hmm? So it helped me. I took off and he helped me then also to guide me to say, go get to a consulting company, especially a consulting company, which will give you the freedom to, uh, 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 to introduce new ways of consulting. And he said, Arthur D. Little Innovation Associates, don't join McKinsey, don't join those big guys because they go to their own methods, you know, and they, they teach you after school and you are 45 years and they say, what can you help us with? So he therefore nudged me in the right direction and also helped me to take, uh, as, as you said, one of the most difficult decisions. Thank you, sir, for that answer. Also, just a out of curiosity, what was your first thought when you received the call saying that you would be asked to join the Planning Commission of India? What was that first thought which it hit you? To ask my wife's permission, because I told Montek when he said this, I said, look, Montek, I'm here with my wife. And, you know, I promised her that I'll be now with her. Yeah, for the rest of our lives, we'll enjoy ourselves, okay? So I have to ask her, he said, sure. So naturally, she was shattered. You know, you promised that having done all this stuff and, you know, building yourself and your career that you're now with me. Um, but she knew the answer and I really let her down. I don't know, I maybe helped my country and myself too. And I got the chance to talk to you people because I was in the planning commission. If I hadn't been there, believe me, 
you wouldn't have been so interested to talk to me. So it's done me, yes, personally. It's done me a lot of good, but uh, maybe I've let her down. So we have, I am from personally from Jamshedpur and we know what Tata Motors mean to this country. So even if you were not there in the planning commission, we would have loved to talk from some it, it has provided livelihood for an entire city, if I talk. Yeah, but there's a difference I found, uh, you know, in the planning commission, it was the whole of India. And there were people who came to meet with you. And uh, as a consultant, I would I have to take an appointment with the chairmen of these big companies. And of course, they would give it to me, but I had to wait. When I was in the planning commission, the chairmen of the companies would ask for time to come and see me. So it was quite interesting. They were my friends, of course, but the, as they would say some of them, it's reversed. <laughs> so thank you for giving me time. And, but not then. It was so many people who represented poorer people who would come to see me. And as a company, frankly, you don't listen to the variety, the diversity of the people around the city, even in Tata's, in the CSR. And let me tell you the story. When I came back, yes, Tata's, who I respected and grew up with, as you know, Tata Steel, the mother company, wanted to create a plant in, uh, in Odisha. And there came the shock of the Klinganaga plant that the police had to be called out to fire and kill people when Tata's were wanting to get land. To Tata's had been telling the story about Jamshitpur, how good we are to people, look at us, we can create these townships and stuff. And yet people didn't want Tata's in Odisha. Why not? Because, and this is where I said the reflection and the greatness of the Tata people, the Muturaman and the Niruka sat down with me and I was a consultant, of course, by that time to them and knowing their values, I was a little senior to them and said, look, you have to say the world changes and you can't be sitting on your glory. And I told them the story that was told to me when I joined the TS as a trainee, when Farooq Mullah, who was the um, uh, head of the public relations uh, of Tata's, sat me down and said, why have you joined Tata's? You wanted to serve the country, why have you joined Tata's? So I told him the stories about the glory of Tata's and stuff, but he knew them because he, would write those stories. So it's good that he'd done his job in my training, that I knew the stories. But he said, Myra, and he spoke with a nice English accent, a Parsi man. He said, you know, uh, but I'm talking my Indian accent, that people, companies earn their laurels, then they rest on their laurels, and then they rust on their laurels. You earn your laurels, and then you rest on them, you know, you celebrate them. And if you keep doing that too long, you rust on your laurels. And I wanted to join Tata Steel because it was the mother company, right? And he knew that. And so his having used this metaphor about rusting when I was looking to join Tata Steel struck me even then. Rusting means what? You stop learning, you stop seeing how the world is changing around you. And you think that, we were talking about leaders earlier, that you think that because you yourself in the past or your predecessor in the past have done great work, you know how things should be done, how you can change things to the benefit of the people. Have you listened to the people of Odisha today? They are not the sort of tribal people that were in Jamshedpur. It wasn't even called Jamshedpur when Jamshedi Tata was getting the factories. Yes, you have created clinics and you've done nice town with hospitals and so on, which you were just talking about. But who owns those hospitals? Who is providing this high class service to the employees? And so when the Duke of Edinburgh visited Jamshedpur and Lucy Modi showed him the place and when the Duke of Edinburgh in Calcutta was asked by the reporters of India what they thought about the great Indian enterprise, he said, I'd much rather live in Edmonton and not in Jamshedpur. And people were shocked. What is Edmonton and Jamshedpur? So when I was appointed by Sumant Mulgaonkar to help build that factory in Pune, J.R.D. Tata told me the story. He said, Myra, this is what the Duke of Edinburgh said then. Do you know where Edmonton is and what it is? I said, I don't. He said, go look it up. So I did. It's uh, headquarters of the uh, 
Alka and the Aluminium Company of Canada. It's out in the boonies of Canada, like Jamshedpur was in the boonies of India. But there, the Alka and Company has world-class hospitals and schools and uh, sports stadiums and things. All of them are owned by the people in the community. They're not owned and run by the company. And so this idea then struck us in Pune and Sumul Magaka then said, Myra, good, Jay has given you a question. We are going to create in Pune an enterprise in which people will have the best houses, but they'll own their own houses. People will live in their own communities amongst their own people very well. And thus they will be seeds in their community of new ideas and change. So figure out how without providing company built houses to them, people can live well. It's again fortuitous, serendipitous that uh, Hasmukh Parik had the idea of creating a housing finance corporation in India. And so he was a friend of Sumit Mulgaonko and said, look, I need uh, to build this idea in India, but you know, I just can't lend loans to people and how will I collect it and be sure I get it because I'm getting you know, public money uh, to, to make this. So if a company's employees could be the borrowers of my monies and uh, the company would somehow sort of guarantee that they would pay back, then I could start there. So if we were building our own houses, we wouldn't need HDFC. But because we were helping our employees to build their own houses, HDFC could help them. And if we were allowed by government to allow HDFC to deduct the repayments of the loans from the salaries, which was not allowed otherwise, you know, but to make a special arrangement, which then has become part of the law also certain things if employee signs up would be done. So that scheme started there, okay? So unlike in Jamshedpur, where when people left uh, till years ago, they would wonder what to do with the rest of their lives. Where are they going to live? Because they don't own their houses. Okay, that's a change and you're allowed to own, but it's company land. Where would you build in the, in the Jamshedpur and own the house? And therefore in Pune, this wasn't a problem. The people who have retired after serving telco in Pune, they live in houses they have built in the places they want to build. And they own their houses. They're not insecure, but where will I go now? Very good evening, sir, Deepika this side. It's been an absolute bliss hearing you so far. So, sir, I just have one question for you, uh, which is in regards to your association with the Planning Commission of India. So you said that you were a little skeptical about joining this organization because you were not a proper economist. So what were the visual road blockers that came across your way and how did you hustle with them to get an achievement? You know, I hate to... Tell people, uh, look, I've written a book about it because I've been asked this question. So this book is called uh, An Upstart in Government, My Journeys of Learning and Change. Hmm? Um, so the task given to me by uh, Manmohan Singh was to uh, understand why uh, the, the present policymaking process and the present planning commission then was not having the effect as much as we would like it to have. It had great effect and that India had progressed uh, since independence had progressed since 1991 and so on, but not as fast as we need. And we've seen that at the time of the COVID already. Hmm? It, and this is, was visible to people who wanted to look at that we are not really helping the people of the country. Yes, our growth rate GDP uh, is high. Hmm? So uh, what did I learn? I learned a lot about how do you, um, help an organization to change while it is still performing in the ways it is required to perform. So there's another book before that called Redesigning an Aeroplane While You Are Flying. That is the art of bringing about systems change because you always are part of a system. You can't be outside like an engineer and saying, I'm designing that thing and creating a machine and now I can sell it to you and you can use it. And then I design another new machine, another rocket to take you to the moon like Elon Musk. I'm part of the very system that has to be changed and your support of me will help me to change the system. So you must trust me, I much listen to you. So this is a different way of transforming an organization in which you are a catalyst and a very good listener to people unlike yourself in the system. Now we've come to 8.30 and uh, I'm sure there could be more questions, but I would like to be pausing here. <laughs> and stopping here perhaps.
Absolutely, sir. Uh, like there's already so many hands raised. I'm sure students could go on for another two hours. I mean, thank you so much for taking out all of this time for sharing this amazing treasure of experience with us. And every single person in this session would aspire to be half the leader you've been. Now, no, I would never, you said many questions. I'd be very grateful if you could please record those questions and send them to me. Sure, sir. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I would like to then perhaps be able to write you a note back and responding to uh, at least some of the questions, if not. Uh, Absolutely, sir. At least half of them would be mine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You so, and I can have a private talk then, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I would love that. Uh, I would now like to invite uh, Suyash Kumar, the liaison of the Kautilya Consult Club, to deliver the vote of thanks. Uh, good evening, sir. Um, what a session it was, uh, Mr. Myra. I would like to heartily thank you for taking out your valuable time to take up the session with us and sharing your valuable knowledge with us today. I think I speak for everyone when I say that it has been a highly eventful evening and how privileged and honored we are to have you here amongst us. I'm sure the learnings from your experience, including your journey and the decisions you've made, the problem solving techniques, uh, all of will us, um, make, a, make us better leaders, better managers and better people in the future. On behalf of XLRI, uh, the incoming and the current batch of GMP and the Quartilia Consult Club, I extend the vote of thanks. We are all really inspired by your words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. And I'm looking forward to the questions and further hmm, consultations, interactions with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, 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 sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. So, why is it that you don't have to